Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. And today, we are continuing our journey of focusing on one municipality every Friday for the foreseeable future. So today, we find ourselves back in Portage of the Prairie, Manitoba. And today, we are joined none other by the City of Portage of the Prairie Councillor, Preston Meyer. The city of Portage La Prairie has small town charm with a rich tapestry of history and natural beauty. Located along the Assiniboine River, the city is a harmonious blend of urban conveniences and rural tranquilities. Known as the friendly city, Portage La Prairie embraces a warm community spirit that welcomes both residents and visitors alike. Now we will be right back with our full interview of cross-border interviews featuring Councillor Preston Meyer. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Councillor Meyer, thank you so much for sitting down with me today and talking about Portage of the Prairie for our third installment of the Focus On show, where we focus on one municipality every Friday for the foreseeable future. Portage of the Prairie seems to be my second home, and I'm so glad that uh, another councillor has taken uh, the opportunity to come on the show to talk about Portage of the Prairie. So thank you so much. And I want to start by asking you a question I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Preston? Well, first of all, you're very welcome uh, for uh, me being here, and, and and I thank you for the opportunity, obviously. As I was mentioning earlier, uh, anything I can do to talk about the positive aspects of what our community is and what it brings, I'm all over it. So, uh, great question, obviously. I, um, I've i been involved uh, in a number of things uh, back, Portage being my hometown, and uh, like most kids, I, I left uh, to see the big world. Didn't really involve myself too much at that point in time, although I was on uh, junior council at... Um, in my high school or my junior high school uh, at that point in time but uh, more for whatever reasons at that time but then I came back uh, I had the opportunity uh, Chris to uh, visit a number of communities and live in a number of communities around the province when, and even in, in Saskatchewan and uh, in northern Ontario so when my wife and I um, decided where did we want to go what was the next stage of our life we decided we wanted to come back to our home community and that's what really brought me back to Portage in the early 90s. Fortunate enough, I had an opportunity to see a lot of the communities, and I really felt a need that I wanted to be able to be involved in our community. And I know my story is not unique. I think most people you talk to will have a similar story to it. So with my kids just uh, at that point in time when we moved back, they were uh, you know under five years old at that point. And uh, so we came back, made uh, Portage our home community, and we always said we wanted to kind of be involved in their schooling, and that's really where it started. So I started off with uh, parent council, uh, wanted to kind of see what was going on in our local schools here within Portage Prairie, and that carried on until 2006, and that was when I had the epiphany. In 2006, uh, the school division locally was actually going through a, an amalgamation. We had currently had, had two high schools in Portage that I was familiar with because, of course, I went to high school here in Portage and uh, and they amalgamated them into one. And I did not like that. Uh, I thought for a growing progressive community to have the diversity to be able to have a couple of different high schools, I thought was really good. And, I, and I'm going to be brave in saying this because I did say it at the time is that I really thought the people running our division and the board that sat there were, were at a level of incompetency. Why were they going this route? So what did I do? Rather than complain, I actually ran for school board at that point in time, and I did have an agenda. Uh, my agenda was to fix everything. I'll finish up that story in just a second. Fortunately enough, I was elected to, to school board at that time in 2006, 
And it was very quickly, I had another epiphany that realized how competent these individuals actually were, <laughs> how competent the system was. It had challenges like everything else, but uh, it made me realize that I wanted to see it from the inside out and, and to be involved in it. I stayed on, of course, for the first term. I was elected the second term, and we were actually acclaimed the third term. So I did have 12 years of uh, kind of municipal politics a little bit, uh, even though school board uh, does run under the radar. And I, I, I ended up that with no direction of where I wanted to go. I, I wasn't say, hey, I'm going to run on school board, and then I'm going to run on council, and then it'll go for there. But really what happens when you get into that and you start dealing with that level of, uh, and I will call it municipal politics because it really is, I felt, you know what? I want to do what I can to help our community on one hand of many around. And and how best could I do that and serve that and see that from the inside? And that's when I did take uh, uh, put my name in for council back in 2018. Fortunately enough, I was elected and uh, I've worked with the, the previous council up to that point in time and enjoyed it. Felt so strong that we were going the right direction and I wanted to support it the way I could that uh, I ran again in 2022. And, and now I'm serving, of course, my second term. So it's not a unique story, but that's really kind of how I got to where I'm at today on that part of my life. So uh, there's a lot to unpack there, but I want to start by asking you this because you run for three terms and the, you, I always hear the old adage, uh, three terms and I'm done and I'm done. I think I, I, I've done everything that I can do and that's why I'm moving on. What was it about that third term for you that you said, okay, I've done everything I can do at the school board, and now I want to take it, and I, I agree, school boards are sort of a municipal level of government, they are local, they're with, they're represented by the people, like literally in their communities. What made you say, okay, I've done all I can do here, now it's time to go a little bit bigger, now let's take what I've learned here at the school board and transpose it to what I could do at city council. I learned very early in coming on school board again about governance, right? And uh, that you're not down into the weeds. And I really kind of, how do I say, not develop, but that that was really what I understood organizations to be. And I, as I say, I had a strong epiphany at that point in time that you're not driving the grade or you're not teaching the classroom, you're not throwing basketballs at the uh, at the hoop, uh, that you're there to really work with the other people that are around the table for the the um, the strength of our division. And um, said, you know what, at that point in time, I wanted to maybe just take it to that next level and see if there was anything that I could offer from a municipal perspective in, in regards to city council to really say, hey, how do, what can I do to help this community be a place that my kids want to come back to once they're graduated, gone through high school, leave to see their world. And I really want it to be a community that, uh, that they want to come back to in a, in a certain period of time. I don't often get to ask this question on this show, and I'm so happy that I get to in this interview. Um, you, you kind of leveled up in some sense because you go from school board trustee to the from the chair up to a uh, city councilor. Was it an eye opening experience for you, or are the governance structures at the school board trustee level and the city council level similar enough that it wasn't a big culture shock for you when you sat uh, at that first council meeting in 2018 and you kind of just sort of were able to get into the nitty gritty of what's going on at City Hall quicker than potentially someone who doesn't have that background experience at the uh, council table or a director's table? I think I was very fortunate to be able to have that experience. And it wasn't a big jump because the governance models between that type of a board, uh, which is a municipal elected board with taxing authority compared to a, a city council municipal board with taxing authority, um, was uh, was very similar. Uh, I mean, we, we knew we only had one employee, right? And we didn't get down into the weeds and that we were there to develop policy and procedures. And I always looked at it through probably three lenses. One I always looked at as to what the past was. How did we get to where we got to? The second thing I looked at is our current situation. What are we doing today? And then I always looked at it and said, okay, how do we do the things today that's going to affect the future down the road and not only put a positive impact on it moving forward, but also not handcuff future, uh, future councils to um, do things, right? Because I think everybody plays a role and we're really building on the backs of previous councils as to where we got to at this point in time. 
Before we talk about the city as a whole and your role as uh, the chair of the planning and economic development, I want to stick on you for a few seconds here because you have represented two levels of government that are the closest to the people. You don't go to Winnipeg to do your job. You don't go to Ottawa to do your job. You are in your community 24 seven. And I, that means that, you know, the majority of the people that live in your city, you know, the majority of people who you represent when you're looking at issues, let's just take the city hall, the city council perspective here for a second. When you're looking at individual issues, is it hard to look at individual issues as a citywide issue rather than a local individual issue? Because you're not there to represent the people who have just elected you. You're there to represent everyone in the city, even those who, and I'm going to say this because you used the word here, those who think you are incompetent in what you're doing. So is it hard to look at every issue as a city issue rather than John's issue or Sarah's issue? If I understand your question correctly, <laughs> I, I really think you have to look at it from a holistic perspective. I mean, I, I don't want to use the word lost leader just for lack of a better expression, but there's certain things and certain decisions I think that you have to make, but you have to look at it from how does it affect the city in its entirety? I mean, the first phone call I got when I first became on counselor and maybe backing the bus up real quick on school board, you were really under the radar, right? It wasn't as you're not as exposed. You, you, you weren't, um, uh, you know, in the media as much as you would be. City council certainly does have a, a higher profile. You're just you're more exposed to the individuals. There's more issues that can come in on hand. Um, so. Uh, when you make a decision and if again, if I'm on the right track here, when you make the decision for I won't basically, sorry, basically what I'm asking is, yeah. is it hard because you have to look at every single issue as a citywide issue. You can't look right. at it as a southeast issue or northeast issue or a northwest issue. You have to look at it as a city issue. But individual people come to you all the time. And I'm assuming whether it be a pothole or construction on Saskatchewan Avenue, which I know you're still working on, and they have very important issues that they believe are the most important issues to them. Is sure. it hard to say no to people because you are so close to them? You are, you know, these people left, right, and center. You, you go to the grocery stores, you go to school functions with them. You meet with them at the local coffee shop and you're not calling them from Ottawa or Winnipeg and you are local. Is it hard to be a local representative when you have to balance the needs of the entire community with the needs of what people are looking for? I, I, I think no. Uh, when you make a decision, and, and I've always, as I say, looked at it through the lenses holistically, is how does it affect the entire city? Um, is your issue, if it's an operational issue, I don't delve into those, right? The only time I would delve into those is if I, you know, I said, hey, have you gone through the proper channels? Have you called operations? Have you talked to the city manager? And then if you still don't get uh, you know, the answer that you want, then you can bring it up to us and we can look at it from a policy perspective, right? Again, if it affects a small area of town, we've always heard the not in my backyard uh, stories. The right? NIMBYism is live and well, I'm assuming. <laughs> it is always alive and well in every community. 1,700 communities our size across the country. I'm sure it is. So as much as I take any kind of um, question, concern, complaint into consideration, and that does, we do look at that very, very strongly. We still have to balance it out by saying, how does it affect the entire city? And, uh, and I think that's the lens you have to look at it on. Do, are there going to be obviously citizens that will maybe be a little bit upset because you're not dealing with that pothole? Yes, I get that. The very first phone call I had when I got on council was actually somebody called me to tell me their pipes were frozen. So, <laughs> which was kind of interesting because I thought that through a little bit. I'm going, well, why are you calling me? Right. So obviously, I, I hopefully want to change a bit of the education that people understand what the role of a counselor actually is. Oh, Preston, you just said the magic word that I love talking about. So <laughs> once you're finished, we're talking about jurisdictional roles here. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So, yeah. So really, I guess if I was to answer your question in a nutshell, no, it, it, it doesn't. I mean, people understand that I got to make a decision or sorry, I don't make the decision. Council makes the decision uh, around the table with the information that you have. And you're really trying to do it based on where are we at now and obviously where are we going? You you have sat on school board, school board, and you've sat on city hall. 
And I would say, and this is Chris Brown saying this for those who are about to send nasty emails to the counselor, please don't send them to me because I'm the one who's about to say this. I believe there is a misunderstanding within this country on the roles and responsibilities of our local levels of government, the school board and the town city hall. Are you seeing that in Portage La Prairie? And when you do get approached with issues that are outside your jurisdictional purview, how do you tell people it's not my responsibility without saying those words because you don't want to be seen as someone who's just saying, not my problem, go talk to someone else about it? Well, I think I got to be straightforward. I do tell people that, look, that's not my role, but here's what I will do to help you get to that next level. If you're not up front now, you're never going to be up front. And people have to understand, I'm not the guy that takes the um, the, the granular and fills the pothole. I'm not the guy that comes in and unthaws the thing. We've got an incredible operations department. And if they're aware of the situations, they'll address it to the, the best of their ability. You got to understand that what we do as council is we create policy. And uh, really, our only employee is our city manager. And I mean, we've been really blessed, Chris, and I know I may be changing the subject here, but we've got some of the top people in the industry, not only within our city administration, our city manager, but also our department heads. And, and I think that makes our role a lot easier. So when I send somebody to say, hey, you know, here's what you really need to do is you really need to talk to operations about that, or you need to call it into the, the 311 number or to our app. That way it's logged, that way it'll get done, and hopefully it comes to your satisfaction. If you go through all the steps, and you still don't get satisfaction, that's when you certainly can approach myself or anybody else around the council table. I'm going to do a little shameless plug here, and I apologize so because we're in the middle of the industry, but I've got to do this. But for those who want a good conversation about the role of council relationships with their city manager, this Monday, so this past Monday as this airs, we sat down with Sherilyn Knox of Porters the Prairie and Nathan Petto, the city manager from Porters the Prairie, talking about that issue, about that relationship and how do you build a great relationship. So check it out on Municipal Affairs. Um, I have one last question before I turn to the city as a whole, because I'm cautious of time and I want to talk about some of the big things that are going on. There are days that you know that you have to get up and walk out the door and you have to put your counselor's hat on because you are closest to the people and they know who you are. But I'm assuming there's days where you just want to be Preston, you just want to go out, grab a carton of milk and come back without that 45 minute conversation. Have you found that work life balance to be achievable in a community like Portage the Prairie and or are there days where you tell your wife or your kids you're running to get the milk because I don't want to have to spend 45 minutes talking or do you enjoy those conversations that randomly stop you in the middle of a grocery store and ask you what's going on at City Hall or I have a question. The answer to that in short is yes, uh, I do. It took a while to get there. Um, I actually enjoy now the conversations I have. And I'm, I'm like a lot of people within our community, I'm involved in a variety of things, whether it be a, a service organization, whether it be other volunteer groups, other boards that I sit on that aren't related. So the first answer to your question is I have to, wherever I'm at at the time, I have to look through that lens. If I'm representing city council, I look through that lens. If I'm representing my professional life, I have to look through that lens and I can't combine the two. And I've had the conversations is, look, you know, we've got to stay on this topic right now. But if you want to have that conversation about that issue later, we can certainly address that, too. But I actually really enjoy if I'm on the golf course or I'm in the curling rink or I'm in, in the in the um, in the uh, grocery store and. Any counselors that you talk to will be in that same position. They do get stopped in throughout how they handle it will be up to themselves. But I actually really enjoy that. I really enjoy the interaction, the talking to the people. Now, my wife, on the other hand, <laughs> she, she's learned that if we're out to uh, Walmart or we're out to uh, a, a local restaurant <laughs> here, she just lets it happen. She's come to the, such of the realization that and she's a bit of an introvert, but she just lets that happen and, and she's perfectly good with it. I would not be able to do that if it wasn't for the support that I get from her when we're out or my kids or when I'm out with friends as well. I, I've never asked this question before, but you bring up a good point. How important is it for the family to support you in this endeavor? Because the life of a counselor is not a part-time job. You have a full-time job and then you're also basically a part-time counselor with full-time hours. How important is it to have a, a strong family supporting you while you're going through this sort of uh, 
odd moment where you are on the go 24 seven and you can be pulled away for council emergencies or council meetings at a moment's notice. All I can say is invaluable. I mean, if it wasn't for the support, I mean, my kids are old enough that they've all, of course, grown up and left. Uh, although I still have one still in Portage La Prairie and one that's still intending to come back, but uh, it's invaluable. And as I say, my wife, my relationship, she gets it. She understands what I do and I understand what she does. And uh, we're actually, our relationship probably hasn't been any better uh, because we understand each other's role and what we're prepared to do. She doesn't always come out with me to every uh, council event that, that happens, uh, but she'll come out to the odd one and vice versa. Did you ask her prior to running in uh, a council for 2018? Did you say, oh, "Hun, i I'm thinking about this. What's your thoughts? Absolutely. Although even though previous to that, when I ran in 2006, uh, and I know it's it's school board, but it's still a really important function to me, the um, the same support I had back then. And, uh, and, and it hasn't changed. It's just gotten stronger as we progress through. So that's a, each individual uh, relationship that uh, people will have, but uh, it's been it's been really good. I want to turn to the city as a whole now and talk about some of the challenges and accomplishments that the city has gone through. Um, for those who have been paying attention for the last few weeks, we've been sitting down with uh, councillors from across Portage to the Prairie and talking about their different portfolios that they chair. Joe, uh, Councillor Joe Massey, we ch chatted about finance. Uh, last week, we talked to Councillor Doyle about protective services. Now, uh, Councillor Meyer is the chair of the Planning and Economic Development Committee, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, if that's the correct uh, yeah. name for it. Uh, <laughs> Portage of the Prairie. So we're going to be talking about this. But before I do, as I always do on the show, I'm going to preface this, this line of questioning that saying, this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is his perspective and opinion as the chair of the Planning and Economic Development Committee. With that being said, I have to ask, in your opinion, counselor, um, what is the state of Portage to the Prairie today when it comes to planning for the future? I think we're probably in the strongest position that we've been in in a while. And that doesn't mean that yesterday wasn't strong and, and two months ago wasn't strong and a year ago wasn't strong. But as a snapshot in time, this council and, and building on the backs of previous councils have built up a number of systems and we look at it strongly from a regional approach. So if I said I look back 10 years ago to where we were, to where we're at today, I think we've developed some great regional approaches. Uh, we, we run, of course, our economic um, development office is regional. Our planning district office is regional. So throughout the course of the last number of years, we've had some great people in the right places that have really developed how do I say it, a, uh, a framework or a structure to foster economic growth. The results are there because of the industry that's settling here, the commercial business, the multipliers, some of the downtown businesses. So I think when you get that framework set up, Chris, I think that's the biggest strength that you have. It's not about another brick and mortar building. They'll come, that's the end result. But if you really strongly foster the economic growth through your bylaws and procedures and, and, and those types of things, it creates a very strong position for Portage. So yes, we have challenges, which I know you know that we have, and uh, whether it be some infrastructure or water or hydro, those things that we have to deal with. But, but I think as an economic perspective, we're set up regionally really, really strong, uh, and for a couple of reasons, which maybe we can expand on later. And then also the uh, planning district is regional as well. I want to talk about economic development for a second, because... Um... I used to work in a municipality and as a communications and marketing person, and I can tell you whenever there was a new, and I, and I don't want to say, uh, uh, how, do I, how do I say this without being rude to the, 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 a new franchised company that comes into town. There's always the people who would say, this is going to destroy our downtown core. This is going to hurt our mom, pa shops that are currently in our community. How do you balance the growth of your community, the diversification of those brick and mortar uh, uh, stores with the community that you have now? Because I can imagine it's a fine line that you have to walk, but you also don't want to be seen as anti-development, anti-business, anti-anything, particularly when in this economic time that we're in, things are things and people are struggling. Sure. If you're talking from, let's say, a retail sense, uh, I mean, retail, 
business owners. And unfortunately enough, in my private life, I, I've dealt with a number of, uh, of retail businesses throughout the years. So I, I've seen some of the insight. I was president of the chamber uh, previous to coming on council, and it got me the opportunity to talk to a lot of business owners in out and around as well. And I think um, businesses come, businesses go, we get that, right? But anybody that's willing to invest money into a business to receive a return on investment has to be given their due diligence, um sometimes there's things you have to work around i mean we talk about conditional uh uses and uh and variances and so on and, and council will make the decision if they're prepared to go outside the the current bylaw to get there but i think the support that we give them i think is is insurmountable we've gone as far as we actually have an investment uh team uh which is one of the few communities that i've heard of when i talk to some of my colleagues around the province Basically, it's anybody that wants to come to Portage that's looking for any type of an economic opportunity. They want to open up a, an industrial business, so they want to look at a commercial enterprise. We have an investment team that's set up that encompasses not only our city manager, but our, our, uh, our MCAO, our economic development officer, and all the people at the table that really it's a one-stop shop if somebody wants to find out the information on what to do. That, I think, is the strength on its own merit as well, that we've taken those steps to be able to do that. Somebody coming here doesn't have to go to one area or a different area and go to 17 different places in order to find the information they're looking for. Does City Council try to attract different types of businesses and or even housing units for a planning side? Or are you letting the free market sort of try to balance itself out with whatever wants to come, we're willing to work with you as long as you go through the process, you do your due diligence, as you've just talked about. What steps does the city play in sort of diversifying the economy, but also not being seen heavy handed at one side or another? Sure. The best answer to that question is that currently we're a bit on the free market, right? You know, people come and I think Portage has got enough recognition. We've had almost $1.2 billion in direct investment uh, over the last um, seven or eight years, not counting the multiplier businesses that go along with that. I also think councils at a stage where we've had discussions that maybe there are specific things and this of course is a recommendation from our not only through our strategic plan that maybe we can look at specific opportunities that we want to see here uh whether it be a downtown pub or whether it be that i mean we're not there yet we also have created what we call developer days that we're pretty proud of we invite certain developers as also local developers and we show them the assets that we have and say hey here's what we've got here's what we want what can we do about it? And uh, that started to take a bit of a foothold and it's certainly working in the right direction. So I think it's a combination of both. And uh, and I think in order to have strength, you need that. You need the diversity with it. So you, you've talked about the city taking a more regional approach to a lot of planning, working with, I'm assuming, but not limited to the RM of Portage of the Prairie, which is Reeve uh, Campbell Light, uh, who has been okay. on the show before. Why take a regional approach? What is the benefits that you see from a regional approach rather than just a city approach? The biggest answer to that question is just strength, strength in numbers and strength in availability. We have a great relationship with uh, with our RM partners. And I think the regional approach has allowed us the opportunity to gain the investment that we've created. Not a lot of municipalities have, and I'll use our tax sharing agreement because that's the number one focus on it. Not a lot of municipalities have a tax sharing agreement in relationship to their neighboring municipalities. So what it does, from my understanding, is that it creates a different level of competition. When we have a regional approach towards it and somebody comes here, our economic development officer just doesn't show them uh, site plans in Portage La Prairie. They're going to find the best spot, whether it be in the RM or the city, in order to try to help that investor or that development come to, come to town. So there's not that level of competition that goes with it. You, you're also, uh, we could talk about economic development probably for a good like hour just on itself here, but I want to turn, just sorry, two seconds. I want to turn to planning and I want to just make sure I'm understanding this correctly. When when the Portage of the Prairie Planning Committee 
it gets together. Are we talking about houses? Because sometimes, are you talking about housing developments? Are you talking about land use bylaw upgrades? What are you talking about when you talk about Portage La Prairie planning? You're talking about all of those. Okay. No, I just yeah. want to make sure because sure. some people, some organizations that I've talked to, when I say planning, they're like, oh, we're only planning for what's going on for the future events. And I'm like, well, that's not what I'm assuming planning is. <laughs> so that's why I just wanted to make sure I was getting that correct. So Great understanding. Housing has been one of the top priorities for a lot of municipalities right now because we are seeing a population boom in this country that we have not seen for probably yeah. about 40 years. Are developers knocking on your door? Are developers coming to Portage La Prairie saying, we want to build? Or are you trying to incentivize developers to come to Portage La Prairie to build housing so that way they, your residents can find housing, but affordable housing as well? Yes and yes. Okay. Uh, not, not, not to sit on the fence, but yes, we do have developers that come here. We've had a number of uh, apartment buildings, um, multi-unit density places that have um, have gone up in Portage over the last number of years. In addition to a, an assisted living facility uh, that we had not had before in Portage and Prairie. But we also want to make sure that we're open enough that we can look out there and say, hey, what do we need in this area? Who can we approach? Who can we talk to? And that's where the developer days came from and said, hey, look, we need this amount. We know we've got so much land available within the city of Portage of Prairie or within the region. What can we do? So not to confuse the issue between the RM and the city, we certainly have our own city strategic plan um, and the RM has their own uh, strategic plan. So some of the things that we look at are certainly myopic in the fact that we're looking at it just from a city perspective. But secondly, our formation of the planning district and our PRED office reported uh, regional economic development is actually a, uh, a regional uh, body at, at this point. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the answer to the second part of that question is yes, we're certainly looking for people that want to come in, whether it be infill housing, whether it be, I mean, affordable housing is another, we could have a conversation on that for the next hour as well. What is affordable housing? But uh, I mean, we're looking, obviously, uh, we're trying to develop an immigration strategy. We're looking at those types of things to make sure you know yourself Chris when people settle in a community and I was no different back in the 90s when my wife and I were deciding where we wanted to settle down and raise our family the three things that were important to me were health education and recreation I mean the jobs are there I had a job and that's what I, I came back to Porsche but the three things that would have made my difference in any community were those three things was health recreation and education City can't control all of those or doesn't have a, a, a foot in, in all of those completely, but those are what I look at from a strong community. Then you need your housing, then you need your jobs, then you need the things that go along with that. Development comes at a cost. And the FCM through, uh, and I forget the organization that they uh, conducted the survey with, said that the average resident, the average municipality, it cost $107,000 for infrastructure for one piece of house. One, one unit, $107,000. Now, I'm not sure if that number exactly transposes into Portage of the Prairie. I do not know. And you can correct me if it does or doesn't. But that money has to come from somewhere. That infrastructure money has to come from somewhere. And I'm kind of asking the uh, Councillor Massey question along with the Councillor Meyer question, but I think it's an important overlap. How do you grow your community, develop your community, attract new businesses, attract new developers without doing it on the backs of the residents that are currently there? Because we are struggling, and I say we as the royal we, because you probably have spoken to people when you're at the grocery store, and things are costing too much. You play a role in that, that responsibility. How do you grow your community? How do you build your community without doing it on the backs of your uh, the residents there? Well, first of all, I think the 107,000 that you had indicated is what I'd heard from Scott Piercy and FCM. And uh, I know where that number uh, came from. I would have no idea. Uh, I'm not a developer. I would have no idea what it would actually cost on that basis. So I trust that the numbers they tell us are probably pretty, pretty accurate across the country. Um, I think council plays a role in some of that, although, again, I'm only one individual around the table, uh, where we have to set up... Um, and, and we have to invest in certain infrastructure. I think the developers have to take a certain responsibility as well. And uh, in order to be able to, whether it be sidewalks or roads or drainage, those types of things. So I think it's a partnership that we have sometimes have to create uh, with our developers in order to be able to 
have the things in Portage or create the things in Portage that uh, that we really need. Some of those are infill housing. Some of those are uh, density in apartments. I mean, we've only got we've got about 53 acres in Portage or Prairie that could be developed, uh, whether it be through a, a commercial, commercial residential mix, residential R3 density, those types of things. So I think it's important that we look at each example on its own merit and say, what can we or can't we do in order to do that without putting it on the backs of taxpayers, although everybody still does share in that responsibility from growth. When you have growth, you have a higher tax base, taxes maybe, I won't say ever go down, because I'm not a big fan of that, but which we can have a discussion on later as well. But um, uh, but I think that it can keep certainly taxes in check, uh, you know, at that point as your community continues to grow. What is the city of Portage Prairie doing today? And today, as in February 29th, 2024, for those who are listening, this has been recorded prior to airing. What are you doing today to set Portage the Prairie up for success in the future? Because the decisions you are making today are going to impact if you're going to have enough infrastructure uh, to build those houses in 2030, 2050, 2075, 2020, 20, oh my God, 200, 2100. Sorry, I was trying to do basic math there, but I wasn't able to do it properly. What is the city doing today to set yourself up for success? Because we've talked about challenges, we've talked about some of the issues, but I wanna know the success that you're doing now to make sure that maybe 20 years down the line when you've left council and you look back and say, you know what? I'm happy we did X because now we are seeing the ramifications or the the sort of the, uh, the shower of what we did back then when we thought it was gonna to be tough. I think probably the strongest area that we have would be our Portage Regional Economic Development Office. That, I know it's regional, but looking at it just myopically for a second for just the city of Portage, um, I think they play the, the largest role in helping us create that environment. When I talk about economic development, it's not only about a business coming to town. It's about having that house and that infill housing that somebody has a, a place to locate so that they've got a labor force that goes along with it. I think uh, through our strategic plan, which uh, has been very well positioned, is gives you a lot of the uh, ideas and the strengths that council is going uh, forward with. And that's being able to foster the environment to say, hey, here's what we need to do in order to get the stuff done. So I don't know if that's a direct answer to the question, because I think every situation is a little bit different. Uh, and I think you have to look at each one on its own merit. Are people supportive? Are the residents of Portage of the Prairie wanting to see the development happen? We talked about NIMBYism a little bit earlier, and we kind of jokingly joked about it, but let's be honest, it's it's there. It's live and well, and people are saying, we do not want our community to change because this is why we moved here. This is why we came back to Portage of the Prairie. But you understand that if that those people don't come back or we don't get new residents to the community, Who's going to have to pay for all the service level upgrades or the changes that are going on? It's the people who live there. So we talk about taxes. Let's talk about taxes. How do you sort of, I don't want to say battle back, but how do you convince the nimbyism crowd to say change is good, growth is good without sort of disrespecting them? Well, I don't know if you can really sometimes change their mind. Um, <laughs> and I Sorry. respect them. I mean, there isn't anybody in this community that I, I really can't say that I, I, I dislike. And I, I think I love everybody. And I love the different okay. perspectives that come across from it. And I'm not trying to sound altruistic, but I do. I, I, I drive around this community. I see the people walking. I see the diversity of our community. And it really does warm my heart to see what our community has become. One quick sidebar to that, I, I remember when I, even though Portage is my home community, I grew up here and then I left and came back, I realized I was back in a smaller community, although with large scale amenities. I was back here when I pulled up to a four-way stop and three clients of mine were at all the three other three stop sites. So it just showed you that there was a smaller community presence to that. When you walk down the crescent and, and the path and you have conversations with people that you know, right? People are generally supportive if they've got the information and understand the rationale as to why you're trying to do something, you're always going to be affected. I live in the downtown area. I live right in what we call our downtown corridor. I'm a, a block and a half from Saskatchewan Avenue, and I've lived here for 20 years, and I absolutely just love it. 
and uh, to see some of the diversity and the and the downtown avenue and where my wife and I go for a walk. So again, I don't know if that answered your question correctly, but uh, that's really I think what it is at the end of the day. And this is this. So last year I took a big giant trip throughout Canada and I drove and on my way back to Calgary. And I say this all the time when I just sit down with uh, people from Port of Suburbia. I think it's probably the best thing that has you guys have going for you. Um, your community knows when someone is not from their community and they want to know why they're there. And it's the most friendliest community I have ever been to because when I was downtown looking for your city hall, because that's what I do on my road trips. I don't go to like famous tourist sites. I go to city halls. Um, I stopped and I got out of my car and three, well, one gentleman, nicest gentleman I had ever met, walked up and said, oh, I see you from Alberta. What brings you to Portage? I'm like, okay, this is kind of a weird <laughs> statement, but okay. Anyway, they're very friendly. They're very nice. There's my there's my rant for the two, two seconds here. I, I am cautious of time, but I want to sort of ask one last question before we turn to my uh, last segment been here and i want to ask there's two questions i want to ask and I, I don't know which one i should choose so i'm going to try and make uh make it into one hybrid question you have now been a counselor for six years coming on six years from when you were first elected you talked about when you first ran for school board trustee, you wanted a place for your kids to grow up in. You have now been a politician since 2000, and I'm qu quoting you, if I make sure I'm right here, 2006 when you were first elected as a school board trustee. So you have seen Portage of the Prairie grow. Looking back on 2006 Preston to now 2024 Councillor Meyer, is Portage of the Prairie a place where you can say that your kids, kids can come back and grow and raise their own families here? The short answer to that is yes, with a caveat. We've still got room to go. And I think as my kids grow up, maybe come back, that they'll want to be a part of that and help making it for their kids. I have a grandkid coming in uh, or grandchild coming in about a week and a half. So I'm pretty excited about that and actually right in Portage. So um, I, I kind of look at it now, I'll look at it through her eyes a little bit and to see what this community does and community brings. I encouraged my, my kids to actually leave Portage when they were done high school, whether it be going to college or university or to see the world a little bit because I really wanted them to respect what they had. And sometimes you don't have that respect until you actually leave, see other communities. And there's a lot of great communities across this country. I don't call us the best community. I call us unique. We've got a lot of neat assets and we could spend another couple hours talking about all those. Uh, but I want them to realize what we actually do have here. There's a place you're gonna settle down. You're gonna raise your family. Where do you feel comfortable? And where's your familiarity lie? That's what we chose, and uh, and hopefully my kids, I know one's already come back, and uh, the other two may not, but the opportunity is there for them to do that. So, so yes, I've seen growth and change uh, from 2006. We're talking, obviously, uh, close to, what is that now? Uh, gosh, 14, 15, 16 years already, uh, where I've seen our community maybe not grow so much population-wise just yet, but really put in the basics that we need in order to create future growth that goes on with it. I want to turn to my last segment now, and it's my favorite segment. Thanks, and Chris. I've I've talked about this for the last few weeks, and I always find it interesting to hear from different perspectives on tourism spots that I should visit. Because after AMM this year, which we will be at, yes, we will be live in person at AMM in Brandon, Manitoba. We've got a few days before we have to hit Suma, so we've promised that we're coming to Portage the Prairie the day after uh, the AMM conference and going to visit some of these great tourist destinations that we, uh, the councillors have been talking about over the last few Fridays. So Councillor Meyer, in your opinion, what are some of the hidden gems? And I mean the hidden gems, the off the beaten path, the thing that you go to when you're tired and you just want to decompress and go away and get get recenter yourself. Where is where are some of the tourist spots that you like to promote? Well, I think at last count there was 103. <laughs> and, and 103 I mean, places. And so I should be there for three days then? <laughs> 
few places, you betcha. But uh, really, if you try to narrow it down, there it, again, it depends. I think on what your interest is. I mean, one of the first places what, that what I what would you, what would you say? Because that's uh, that's all and fine. I'm not trying to interrupt, and I because I like to actually hear this part out. But sure. what are what are the place like if you had a friend or a family member right. coming into Portage of the Prairie tomorrow without mm-hmm. knowing what they wanted to do? What what are the highlights that you would say? Okay, we're going to do this no matter. Chris, when, when you come back to Portage and assuming you were my brother, I, where would I take you? The first place I would obviously take you would be to our island uh, to show you the amenities that we have from not only a recreational perspective, but just from a, it's a place you can walk around. It's quiet. And and uh, I mean, we're not a, a retirement community, but I think people would like to retire here. And I think that is probably uh, one of the biggest assets that we have. Then we've got the recreational side with a, a, a really an incredible arena that Past councils, of course, had uh, had put uh, had, uh, really uh, ran on back in 2012. That really brings in a variety of different events. So you've got all that stuff. But the second place I would take you would actually be our residential museum. I mean, we have such a strong indigenous uh, uh, representation here, and it's an asset for our city. We have one of the only residential museums that actually, I believe, is outside of Ottawa. And it's a federal residential museum. And I think what it does, it puts into perspective kind of where our community is at. And and, um, and it, it's really just a neat place to visit uh, after that. Then I would probably move on to the Fort Lorraine Museum. Again, I've always called it or somebody's referred to it as backyard blindness. You don't always know what you have inside your own community unless you actually open up your eyes a little bit and take a walk around. And I wasn't kidding about the 103 things. We've got that in our region, whether it be Delta Beach or St. Ambrose or Delta Marsh. And I mean, I could go on for another hour and a half here just about the assets that we have, specifically from a tourism perspective. And uh, again, so those will probably be my top three. And then I would take you down through the downtown section, look at some of the old buildings. I mean, the house I live in, it was built in 1890. So you don't have a lot of those. Um, we're 130, what am I, 132 years old, right? And you don't have a lot of communities that have that. But I love that old, my wife is also a big fan of, uh, of the older kind of Victorian style and so on. And uh, so I would take you downtown. I would show you some of the buildings and give you some of the history that uh, went along with those. Because that's the past. It's through the efforts that those people did that really helped us get to where we are today. And it's the efforts that we're going to do in today that will help the next generation move forward from that point. I recently sat down with the mayor of Stonewall, Manitoba, and I asked her a question because I found something online about the name of her community. And I've never asked this to any of your count fellow counselors, but it seems like you're a museum guy. It seems like you like history as someone who lives it at 18. Where does Portage of the Prairie get its name from? Well, it's portaging, right? So what happened was, is that when you had the settlers that were coming back in, back in, I don't know when it would have been, the 1800s of some some type. So it was a portage. It was basically a trade route and uh, the word portage. And that's why I think for the longest time, our logo used to be an individual carrying a canoe, <laughs> which really represented the portaging portion of it at that point. The history is very varied. And uh, but uh, that's where the name portage comes from is through the, the portaging. So. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> that's uh, it's probably the biggest part of it at that point. But... Hey, I, I love learning about different municipalities from counselors who think they know and kind of have an idea. So um, before I let you go, I have one last question for you because I'm cautious of time. And we started by talking about you and your duty to serve. We're ending by talking about the city. And the million dollar question that I end this interview off with is, in your opinion, what makes Portage La Prairie such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I'm not sure where to start. Um, I mean, we can use all of the things that I think every community probably has. There's great people here. There really are people that care about their community. There's great assets, whether it be our Island Park or Crescent Lake or walking paths or Fort Ray Museum or Residential Museum, the Duck Pond at Island Park. There's so many grassroots community groups, have a Holiday Avenue project that they spend their own time uh, volunteering to create um, uh, different things within our avenue. 
right? In order to, if it's a Valentine's Day or if it's Christmas, they, you know, holidays, uh, and they put a lot of the decorations in. We have so many service groups. We've got so many, um, a, a large number of nonprofits that are dedicated to helping some of the, 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 the community, obviously, at that point. So I think what I got to really say, if I was to give it to you in one word, is really a balance. I think our community can offer just about everything to anybody. Again, going back to my first statement about education, we've got great schools. We've got great teachers. We've got a really, really good uh, administration in there. Uh, recreation, we've got some of the best recreational facilities around, whether it be the golf course, whether it be Stride Place, whether it be the um, Rotary Republic Park. Um, and we've got great health. We've got a new hospital, as I know you're aware of, that's coming here as well, which becomes a central point for people from other communities, obviously, to come into here as well. We've got assisted living facility. We've got downtown shopping. I mean, we know the retail scope has changed over the last years, and it's tough to compete with your Amazons and your and your Wayfarers and so on. Um, but I think the uniqueness of some of our shops stand out on their own merit. We've got history. We've got uh, the museum. So when you say, when I say balance, I can, where I wanted to settle is a place that I can pretty much do anything within a 15 minute radius. If I, I need to go get a battery or I need to go to the liquor store, it, it only takes me, um, you know, five minutes to get it out and around. We're so close to Winnipeg, which is a big, big asset of ours, because if I want to go to a Jets game or my, one, my wife and I want to go out for supper out of town, we're not traveling three hours to do it. So I really look at it a bit like a bedroom community because we can use this to get into other locations. But, uh, but really, when you talk about balance, I believe we're one of the strongest balanced communities. And I think that's what brings our uniqueness uh, from that area. Councillor Preston, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and taking 45 minutes of your day to do this interview, first off. Second, and I don't think uh, municipal leaders hear this enough, thank you for serving. Municipal leaders are under uh, extended pressure these days to do a lot more with a lot less from the federal and provincial governments. So the day, the challenges and the decisions that you make on a day-to-day -day basis uh, impact your residents the most and you deserve all the credit you deserve when I say thank you. Thank you for making those tough decisions and being on the front lines and sitting around that council table because any other person probably would have folded by now with everything that's gone over the last six years. So thank you so much for doing this interview and for being part of the show. Well, certainly thank you, Chris, uh, for the opportunity to do this. As they say, if it wasn't for the colleagues that we have around the table and the vision, I think, that we put forward, uh, I wouldn't feel as strong about our communities we are right now. And being able to be involved in it is, is insurmountable. And as they say, the colleagues and the people that I get to work with right now and the strength of our administration and things that go on is just for the betterment of, of our city going forward. So thank you for that. And you're very welcome for, uh, for that. Thank you so much again, Councillor, for sitting down with us today. Now, if today's episode did spark your interest, hit that subscribe button now or follow us on the platform that you're listening to this today. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage from coast to to coast to coast, committed to keeping you well informed as well engaged on the issues that are important to municipalities. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top notch content you have come to enjoy. Now, if you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Now, we are off next week. We are going to be sitting down and interviewing more great leaders from across Canada. So we will be off until Monday, March 18th. Until then, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.